Thank you, Pamela. Yeah, really wonderful to be back. Nice to be together again. Yes, Chandra, we had very different kinds of um, uh, space apart. So Chandra went definitely to the inner well and was on a, a long-term retreat uh, in Colorado <clears throat> in a cabin. And I have been dispersing myself greatly, um, creating an offering down here for a large technological organization, um, very much in line with my Bodhisattva goals and ethics, but a, a bit of a this energy and Chandra is, has been cultivating the inner uh, well. So hopefully we'll be coming and bringing that to you. Both are so important and both are obviously interweaving through our life. Um, there's time that is so meaningful, us, meaningful for us to spend when we are truly in kind of solitary reflection and cultivation and maybe, maybe feeding our demons uh, or really reflecting on gratitude and appreciation, compassion and uh, finding equanimity. And then of course, many of us here, we offer so much to the world. In both cases, we really need the Dharma and we encounter so many obstacles along the way to keeping the Dharma in our mind, uh, keeping the Dharma, especially in our body, speech, and mind. So this evening we will indeed proceed on the Lojong and we are making our way through the slogans. We have 13 left as of this evening. So if that's a significant number for any of you all. And I am I feel fairly certain that you are here this evening because you know who we are and, and the Lojong, but just in case, it might be worthwhile to say that we are on number 46 of 59 Lojong slogans. And that these slogans, each one of them in and of itself is, it's like a gift. It's something that we are receiving and learning how uh, this gift can transform our life. These words have a really specific meaning that we'll unpack and their directions and instructions. Some of them, when you first hear them, they have a huge impact and you get a sense of, yes, I understand that. I wanna apply that in my life. Others, maybe not as clear. So we need to investigate and try them on more. But these 59 slogans really are intended to help us become the warriors of compassion that we already are. And yet, which sometimes becomes tiring or overwhelming or we simply just don't know how to move forward with our compassion in the world. So these practices give us uh, tools and skills and capacities to train our mind and train our heart. So this evening, I will kick us off with a meditation uh, and then Chandra will guide us through a first part of exploring the Lojong and we will do a second meditation. As we've often done with these slogans, we really wanna balance this training of the mind and heart um, not that they're separate, but different aspects of it. So I'll start off with a bit more of our training and attention and focus, and we'll do a more heart-based practice to close. So I'm Eve Ekman, and with Lopan Chandra, and we are both of us in the Bay Area with um, varied experiences in our paths, but I'll say that we've shared happily um, a number of teachers and are so grateful to be sharing with you a lot of what we have learned. And if folks have specific questions on that, of course, we're happy to answer. And we will really look forward to hearing from you all about your experience of the meditation and how these slogans are landing with you. So without <clears throat> further ado, I'll go ahead and get us situated and ready for our first practice. So let's give ourselves a luxurious couple of moments here to <clears throat> find a posture in which we feel supported, relaxed, as well as upright, vivid and awake. Finding a posture that gives us an opportunity, hopefully, to settle a bit of the movement of our body. One where we may not need to continue to move around in order to feel at ease. 
So if you need a couple moments or two just to get a pillow or adjust something, really finding a sense that you could be here stable like a mountain. Let's invite some softening and relaxation through the forehead, between the brows. Softening, relaxing through the eyelids. And continuing to soften and relax through the cheekbones and the jaw, through the lips. And we'll continue now to settle the body in its natural state. This natural state of the body is one of relaxation, stillness, and dignity. Step by step, let's focus on each quality. Relaxation through the body. Finding areas that feel tense or tight. And with kind attention, simply bringing our breath there. Maybe we feel tension or tightness at our shoulder and neck, our lower back or knees. So with our breath, we simply bring our attention kindly without forcing, without expectation. And feel or imagine as though we were breathing relaxation into that area.
And gently shifting now to settle the body into stillness. Imagining ourselves like the mountain, stable base. And steady. As we experience and imagine a stillness through the body, We, of course, notice that there are subtle sensations which are always changing. Maybe we're digesting our dinner. Maybe an itch in the forehead becomes an ache. So the stillness is a posture that we assume, that we apply, that we aspire to. Of course, <clears throat> your mind may be busy. Maybe you become distracted and carried away. No problem at all. Sometimes it can be even easier to experience stillness once we notice this movement of the mind. Now moving to the quality of dignity, naturally arising from relaxation and stillness. Again, this dignity is an aspirational practice. No matter how worn down your body feels, I can still have this dignity. The dignity of being in practice, intentionally showing up to cultivate these qualities of heart, mind, so feel or imagine the dignity of this practice embodied.
This doesn't mean being prideful or arrogant. This is the dignity of honoring. Everything we do, <clears throat> we are with our body. The ways we move through the world, nourish ourselves, the way we celebrate. Consider for a moment a meaningful intention for your body. How might you highlight these qualities, these natural capacities of stillness, relaxation, and dignity? This intention could be recognizing that which already supports the body or possibly that which may be in the way of a true harmonious relationship with the body. Take a couple moments and consider a meaningful intention of how to be with this body, this beautiful vessel, in support of your spiritual practice, in support of relationship to the world and yourself. And we'll gently release this intention to the background and shift now to settling our speech in its natural state. In its natural state, our inner speech can find an effortless silence. For all of us, finding this effortless silence can be elusive. Thoughts and memories and images may arise as well as 
internal dialogues, replaying of events. So let's use following the natural rhythm of our breath to help us settle our speech. Bring, our, bring your full attention to noticing the sensations of breath. Again, when you become distracted, no problem at all. Returning to noticing the natural rhythm of the breath. Again, we may be able to experience this silence, even one breath of it with greater precision and clarity after we've experienced the chatter and buzz of our mind. Take a moment here to consider speech, our communication, inner and outer. There's a profound way which we exist in the world. Make ourselves known, express to others what is inside. Consider an intention here for your speech. What might support a speech that is aligned with your spiritual values, your intention of kindness and care to others and yourself? A couple more moments here, considering an intention. One that could be for our inner speech, how we are in communication and dialogue towards ourselves. And our outer speech, which of course has great impact on those close to us and others.
Invite this intention to recede into the background. As we shift now to settling the mind, releasing the past and the future. And as much as possible, giving ourselves to be right here in this present moment, without distraction, without grasping. Feel the full spaciousness of this present moment. And as much as possible, continue to find yourself right here. Whatever captures your attention, whether leaning towards the future, turning towards the past, grasping onto a certain idea, just feeling distracted, allow it to point you right back here to this present moment. Notice the contrast. Feel and continue to experience this present moment. No need for concepts or words. This completely unconfigured experience of this moment. And once again, let's take some time to reflect on an intention that would be meaningful for the mind. How would we like to turn our mind towards that which cultivates our own and others' well-being? 
what may we need to support or get rid of in order to, to experience that sense of mind that can be present, wholesome, clear. Releasing this intention from the front of the mind. And feeling the settling of the body, speech, and mind in their natural state. Before we bring our practice to a close, let's take a moment to consider this regathering of Sangha, letting it lift our hearts. Knowing that our individual efforts, intentions and aspirations are increased made so much more beautiful and poignant by being together. An appreciation for these teachings passed down for thousands of years, available to us by wonders of technology. How fortunate. Very gently, without really needing to shift anything from this settled body, speech, and mind. Start wingling fingers and toes, blinking the eyes open, coming into this shared virtual space together. Thank you for your practice.
Thank you, Eve. Such nourishment. Are there any questions or comments that are arising in the moment from from that beautiful practice? Always open to a chat or a unmute as a concise question or comment. Probably a sign of a very nice meditation is there's a feeling of uh, quietude and simplicity and gratitude, like what's coming in with Denise. Thank you. Well, I I feel great. Thanks, Eve. And uh, boy, I needed that. You know, I as Eve mentioned, I was uh, I had the opportunity to go into a cabin at Tara Mandala for three weeks. And I had, hadn't done that since I became a mom 21 years ago, and I really needed that. <laughs> um, the theme was unwinding, and it was just what the doctor ordered on so many levels. And uh, just now in that guided meditation, I was there again. You know, it felt really sweet to remember the space that opened and the space that's always here that we actually just kind of forget about. (laughs) But it's always there. And some of the most wonderful teachings that I absorbed, in particular, you know, focusing on on this retreat were about maintaining the awareness of space, the awareness of awareness, throughout the day, on and off the cushion, walking meditation, doing the dishes, taking a solar shower, (laughs) Um, taking a walk in the woods. Um, Good challenge. Very good challenge. Very good challenge. And so coming back into the world, it's easy to just click into the old rhythm and habitual patterns. And that's why the daily practice is so important, because it helps us remember again, and then to have that bleed into into the other activities that we do. And I just have to share, you know, I'm kind of late to the party, but, you know, I'm more of a Tibetan Buddhist trained practitioner. And I took with me a couple books by Ajahn Chah. And I have to say I'm now a disciple of Ajahn Chah. <laughs> yes. He's in Dzogchenpa. <laughs> he's just, he's teaching exactly what the Tibetans teach with slightly different angles and languages. And of course, it's all Dharma. I'm not, it's not like a big aha thing, but boy, oh boy. Boy, oh boy. His book called uh, Food for the Heart, I highly recommend. It's so good, so raw and true and authentic. A Thai, he was a Thai Buddhist uh, forest monk who had training, but also most of his training was just in the practice. And so I found his voice very refreshing and very therapeutic for especially a retreat environment when you kind of think you're going to go nuts, you know, like here I am another day with just me, myself, and I. (laughs) The enthusiasm wears off. The mirror is very clear, and we don't always like what we see. Sometimes it's nice what we see, sometimes it's not so nice. Boy, Ajahn Shah really knows how to speak to all of it. And help us remember that really what we're doing is we are cultivating our our reunion with the Buddha, right? Through mindfulness, through the breath, through the body, speech, and mind. We are uh, getting ready for our, our homecoming, you know, and seeing, resting in the nature of your own mind and awareness, Buddha nature, whatever you want to call it, Rigpa, is an encounter, is a meeting with, with the Buddha. 
the Buddha within, the Buddha all around. So I recommend his book. There are other books. It's just so much gratitude for the pioneers like Jack Cornfield, Joseph Goldstein, all the others who were there in the early days and saw the magic that was effulgent from beings like this and helping to bring them to the West and translate their teachings, their Dharma talks. So Food for the Heart, I highly recommend it. And it gave me such an appreciation for the foundational practices, the foundational uh, earlier teachings, the sutric teachings that are more kind of adherent to the words of the Buddha himself, the sutras, uh, and, and how you know, you have the early phase, the middle phase, and the later developmental phases of Buddhism, and they are all saying the same thing with different flavors, different flares, different colors, different emphases, but it's all Dharma. And um, listening to some of his audiobook talks, too, uh, helped me remember and fall in love again with the Tibetan teachings in a way that was very sweet. And uh, so I wanted to, I just wanted to give you a little taste of where I've been. And, uh, and now I'm back. I'm so happy to be here with you all with Eve. And I can see most of you. What we're doing tonight is the 46th slogan. So we're just chugging along, you know. This is our framework. It gives us a context, a way of framing the essence of the teachings in different ways. And uh, the last time we were together was a little over a month ago, I think. And this this slogan tonight is linked a bit with the last slogan. Um, but this slogan, 46, cultivate three things without letting them deteriorate. Taste that unless somebody's beat me to it. Somebody beat me I did. It. You did already? Awesome. I saw your cursor there in our Google Doc. Um, cultivate three things without letting them deteriorate. So I'll list the three and then I will just riff on the first one, let Eve comment a little bit if she wants on that, and then she'll go into the second, and then I'll comment if I want to on that, and then I'll do the third and same. So we're going to kind of volley these three topics together, and, uh, and then hopefully end with a little meditation if there's time. So the first is faith in one's teacher. The second is enthusiasm for training one's mind or heart-mind, jitta the sem, the heart, mind. And then the third is conscientiousness regarding precepts, vows, and conduct. And so this cultivate the three things without letting them deteriorate. So maintain them, cultivate them, and then don't let them die off. Don't let them degenerate. So the first one, faith in one's teacher, you know, this is especially coming from Mahayana, Vajrayana, but of course the early teachings as well. The teacher is like your doctor, right? Like uh, they even say in Dharma, you know, the, the, the Buddha is the, 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 the supreme uh, medicine man. <laughs> he really is. He's the doctor, Buddha doctor. In terms of our woes of being in samsara, it is tough here, isn't it? Wow. And so I want to just uh, read a quote uh, the, yeah, from one of the sutras to this effect. As the sick man relies on his doctor, the traveler on his escort, the frightened man on his companion, merchants on their captain, and passengers on their ferrymen, if birth, death, and negative emotions are the enemies you fear, entrust yourself to a teacher. The teacher is so important, you know, whether it's a guru or just a spiritual friend, which is, I think, just as important. I didn't mean to say just a spiritual friend, but, you know, in Tantra, the guru is, is a pretty big uh, role to play, right? But in other ways, we can have teachers everyday teachers. And um, 
that's called the Kalyana Mitra, which means a spiritual friend. And so in when we're embarking on some, a new terrain, a new pathway that we ourselves couldn't have come up with ourselves, we need a guide. And so this is why the teacher is so important. Um, there's another sutra that says, Oh, noble one, you should think of yourself as someone who is sick. <laughs> So this is from Pacho Rinpoche's book, The Words of My Perfect Teacher, which is a classic, and there's lots of good nuggets of wisdom that pertains to Lojong here. So I want to just read a paragraph, a commentary by Patrol Rinpoche, page 143. It says, Noble one, you should think of yourself as someone who is sick. So it begins a series of similes in the sutra, Arranged Like a Tree. That's the name of the sutra, Arranged Like a Tree. Sick people put themselves in the care of a skillful doctor. Travelers on dangerous paths entrust themselves to a courageous bodyguard. People afraid of enemies, robbers, or wild beasts look to a companion for protection. Merchants heading for lands across the ocean entrust themselves to a captain. Wayfarers taking the ferry to cross a river entrust themselves to the boatman. In the same way, to be protected from death, rebirth, and negative emotions, we must follow a teacher, a spiritual friend. So obviously a spiritual friend's not going to keep us alive forever. That's not what they mean. But the fear of death and then the, you know, the negative states that can come in the bardo, the intermediary pl- uh, time between one life and the next, if that's something that you, um, um, you know, can go with, it, if we practice dharma, if in a sense we live an ethical life, you know, the bodhisattva life of service and of self-realization and liberation, then the experience of death itself will just be the crown jewel of our life, you know, just a little transition point, just a little doorway we move through. (laughs) And when we move through it, we realize what were we afraid of? This is bliss. God, you know, coming home to the source. Can we develop that kind of courage in our life? Well, Dharma gives us that kind of framework, that view and that courage by study and practice and integration. And so that's why the teacher is important. Also, if we're, you know, it says if you're afraid of rebirth, but really what that means is like being reborn in negative states. You can even think of that as like the next moment. Like if you don't want to be reborn, if you don't want to take birth in the next breath or the next thought in a in a hell realm, you know, like uh, sometimes our thoughts can feel like hell realms, so to speak. Um, you know, negative rebirths, negative thought patterns, negative states. Then relying on the Dharma, how by following a teacher, by receiving teachings, um, and integrating and practicing them. And then also, if we're, he says, you know, in the same way, to be protected from negative emotions. So that's the same thing. You know, we can receive the teachings, we can read teachings, we can study with a teacher, but then we have to put these things into practice. We have to catch, oh, there I am again. Go to retreat for three weeks or more, or even two days. You get tired of the namtok in Tibetan, it's called namtok, <laughs> conceptual ideation, you know. We're so convinced that it's interesting and fun, right? Oh, yeah, distraction, woohoo, entertainment. Then you go into retreat for a while. Sure, you've done that, Vipassana retreats, 10-day retreats, month-long retreats. I'm sure we have a handful of people in here who have really done deep retreat. I mean, even if you haven't, you know, maybe you've tasted a day long or something where you're like, wow, you have to get tired of yourself. You have to get exhausted with the afflictive emotions, these uh, kleshas in Sanskrit or nyonmong in Tibetan that come around again and again to, to, to learn to put them down, right? So it's through the guidance of our teacher, through the guidance of Ajahn Chah coming to me on the book. You know, he was my teacher on retreat. We don't have to be in a body. And then putting those teachings into practice, that's what helps us be
be free of the fear of negative rebirth, ne death, afflictive emotions. But it takes work. It takes work. So, relying on a spiritual friend, faith in one's teachers, and um, oh, there's so much about faith, uh, Eve. I'm just going to take a couple more minutes here. Because I was also flipping through, I remembered from years ago reading this book, The Words of My Perfect Teacher by Patra Rinpoche, uh, a beautiful chapter on faith. And I thought, okay, faith, not just in our teacher, but in the Dharma, faith in the teachings, right? And faith also, like in the three jewels, is very important in Buddhism. And what are the three jewels? Not too far out. Three jewels are the Buddha, who was the teacher in this world system, who taught the Dharma this time around, that we are benefiting from. So faith in that, if it feels right and true to us, we can have a heartfelt confidence and faith in it. Uh, dharma is what he taught, so if we can understand and appreciate that, then we, we can have faith in that. And the Sangha is our community. Faith in that is a refuge. Faith in our friends, our spiritual friends. Go to them when we need help. Believe in them. Have faith that our community can help up uplift us when we need it. So faith is very interesting. And in classic teachings, they say there are three kinds of faith. So we're talking about faith in one's teacher, but what is faith from a Dharma lens? So faith is really said to be the gateway to all teachings and practices. Faith in the three jewels, like I just said. So there's vivid faith, there's eager faith, and there's confident faith. So vivid faith is the faith that is inspired in us by thinking of the immense compassion of the Buddhas and the great teachers. We might experience this kind of faith on visiting a temple containing uh, many representations of the Buddha's body, speech, and mind, or after an encounter with a great teacher or spiritual friend we have just met personally or whose qualities or life story we have heard described. Reading the life stories of great masters is a wonderful way to get inspired and have faith. Then eager faith, so sweet. It's this quality of um, eagerness to be free of suffering. Suffering from negative states of mind, those afflictive emotions, all of the stuff I was talking about. And the eagerness to enjoy our life. Uh, enjoy the happiness of the possibilities of positivity and joy in our life. And an eagerness to engage in positive virtue, positive actions, to do well, to do good for people to help, and also an eagerness to avoid negative actions, right? An eagerness to, to avoid, oh, I'm not going to do that again. I know how that made me suffer. And then lastly is confident faith. This is so important in our practice because sometimes we start to lose faith. Do we lose faith sometimes? I do. So confidence in Dharma, in our practice, in the teachings, and our teacher, it's very important. How do we develop that, though? Not an empty faith, a confident faith, but a confident faith that is um, that arises from the depths of our hearts, Petra Rinpoche says, once we understand their extraordinary qualities and the power of their blessings, of the teachers, of the teachings, of the Sangha. And then it's this total trust in it. In the Buddha Dharma Sangha, the Three Jewels is being a very potent and, and um, true refuge, a place of refuge in samsara. And uh, Padmasambhava, the great tantric uh, Buddhist teacher who was, uh, is attributed for bringing Dharma to Tibet, I'll just say in closing, says this, Confident faith allows blessings to enter you. When you have no doubt... Whatever you wish can be achieved. Confident faith allows blessings to enter you. So, if we're closed down, we're not really open to very many blessings. So see if you, you're closed and try to open. Open a little more sometimes. 
and see what comes in. It's a reciprocal relationship. Okay. There's a story of the old woman and the dog's tooth. Maybe if there's time at the end, I'll loop back around and tell that. Wow. Beautiful, Chandra. And, uh, yeah, I, um, I really, really appreciate hearing about those kinds of faith. And I think, I know you mentioned this uh, the last time you taught, but for those who weren't there, um, we recognize that there's a complexity with having faith and trust in teachers, given yeah, a lot yeah. of the yes. exploitations Preach and um, <laughs> <laughs> unintentional harms that have been perpetuated by especially spiritual teachers. Um, so, um, and also um, wanna say that we're not saying uh, per se, give us your faith. Uh, we are here as your spiritual friends, absolutely. Um, and yet, you know, having a teacher in that relationship isn't just, um, isn't passive. Uh, and that's why I think we are emphasizing the friend here. I will say something possibly um, controversial, but I think a good therapist can be like a spiritual teacher if we're making it a spiritual practice. A key element is someone who is also pointing out to us where we're stuck. And you know, I can almost interpret the facial expressions among my friends when I'm telling them about what I'm doing, like as a pointing out, you know, and I'm like, so I'm thinking about doing this. And they're like, oh, sounds good. Um, but very few of our friends would really have, you know, the, I would say the kind of um, courage to point out for us. And spiritual friendship isn't just, we both like reading Dharma books. It's that's out of line with your dharma. Deciding to do that or to not do that, I think that's actually going to interfere. That's going to perpetuate more klishas. You're going to actually not be moving towards what's wholesome in your life. So it's, it's, it's tough to find folks who can really point out for us. Um, and I have a friend who's asked me many occasions, will you tell me when I'm out bounds and when I'm acting out against my own um, best interest? And I, you know, in, in many years, I think I've done so once um, and it, it's very hard to do. So it's, we're saying how invaluable it is. Um, and yet, yeah, it can, it can be hard to find that, um, to find that experience. So we start with that ability to feel some trust and faith. I think that's just so, so beautiful. Um, so of these, of these three, you know, the three things that, uh, we should cultivate without letting deteriorate. I'm going to talk about joyful enthusiasm, which is a uh, uh, <laughs> something I just find to be inspiring in and of itself. And it's interesting the way that um, it's brought about in this and other teachings, which the enthusiasm is really to be such an essential feature of our path to awakening of really being able to sustain ourselves. Uh, Thich Nhat Hanh kind of in, in a famous talk talks about how you put a pot on the stove with water in it, you let it boil, you put the potatoes in there and then you don't turn off the fire. You have to keep the fire on if you wanna cook the potatoes. Very simple way, but our joyful enthusiasm, it's like that fire, that ongoing passion, that ongoing dedication to the practices. And when I was thinking about it um, in preparation for our time here together, I think about it as really feeling like what we're doing is meaningful. I'm doing this not because in the moment it always makes me happy because um, as Chandra experienced in her three weeks, uh, just being alone with our mind doesn't always make us happy, right? But we do it and we keep doing it. And we do it for three weeks because of that, yes. But if we make it too rigid, like I'm doing this because I believe in it without that joyful quality, we also dry it out. We make it just kind of, it, it won't serve the same purpose if we do our practice with this intensity, but without the joy. So I, I, I love that aspect, the joyful enthusiasm and kind of a, a way that we are persisting and, and 
I, I don't want to say pushing through, but kind of um, inspiring us to be to get through. And that meditation, I, you know, I, I led us, and we'll we'll talk about this a bit more. But you know, we bring that to everything, that joyful enthusiasm, not just when we're meditating, but to our body, our speech, and our mind, right? And in all of those ways together. So when again, when we think about this joyful in, enthusiasm, when we think about um, I guess, you know, like how can we um, continue to feel like what we're doing matters? I, I was looking at, there's a, a whole body of research I really love that talks about meaning as a buffer for stress. So when we believe in something, when we have faith actually, um, and this, this is really especially true for when we have a sense of spiritual meaning, it can allow us to deal with stress. There's been a lot of research studies and, and some of them actually um, looking at people who sur survive really different, difficult um, life and natural disasters. So there was a study that was done after Hurricane Katrina and looking at PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, and how people identify with their sense of um, spiritual meaning. I believe not that Katrina happened to me for a reason, but I believe that, you know, my recovery from this matters. You know, I have some, you know, it's easy to have joyful enthusiasm when things are going well. How do we have joyful enthusiasm from our practice when things are hard? And this study, again, this isn't in a laboratory. This is a kind of naturalistic study in the world. It found that people who have a sense of meaning and purpose within their life as a whole, a spiritual meaning and purpose, were much more protected from PTSD and depression. They've done this work in hospitals, they've done this work in schools, the sense that the effort we're doing has a purpose and a meaning. So I, I just love that idea. So it's not just the joyful enthusiasm for the sake of joyful enthusiasm in our practice, but because the joyful enthusiasm makes life more bearable to feel connected to a greater sense of purpose, to be excited maybe when new obstacles come our way um, as that opportunity, right? And it might take us a minute. It's not as though we immediately need to see, but that we can, all of us, you know, start making that rich muck and mud of our life into that which grows something beautiful. It's just, um, it is, there's no greater magic. You know, no David Blaine or any other magician will do anything quite so incredible as making the total BS of our life something beautiful. And so that's, you know, that's a way I've, I really love thinking about specifically um, this teaching. Chandra, thoughts, thoughts on that one and the joyful enthusiasm? I love it how you bring it down to earth and uh, and you made me think of David Blaine who I hadn't talked thought about in a really long time. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's so true and I love what you said about meaning and I, I that just uh, you know being a mother also and watching the heartbreak of my kids you know over the years or right now especially with COVID I I can see that that's very true for especially the college kid, you know, meaning uh, can be very, very important, but not always easy to find when your brain is still developing and you're only 21. <laughs> like, what is my meaning? And, uh, and the enthusiastic effort to, to keep, turning over the stones to find that meaning for us because nobody's really going to find it for us and that's a big part of growing up yeah thank you so now then the the, the third aspect here is um, conscientiousness regarding precepts vows and conduct so have been conscientious you know and it doesn't have to be monastic vows that we're talking about here there are some classic uh, just lay vows that uh, buddhists 
ta- tend to take. You can take one or two or all five of them. There's these five precepts that are quite common. And I thought as a Sangha, you know, a lot of us have been together for a while now, and, and I don't think we've ever really talked about these very bedrock uh, precepts. Maybe in the past I have. I, I, don't, I don't have a clear memory of that. So I thought um, to share that as a way to close the topic of the evening before we hopefully meditate, maybe hear another story too, um, as something to take with us as we move about our life after tonight. And I'm drawing these from a document that I helped uh, draft for the organization that I've worked with for 15 years, Tara Mandala. Tara Mandala is a Buddhist retreat center in Colorado, and you know we have retreats there. We have teachers come, and over the years we have, we've we've come to feel that we really need all staff and employees and teachers who come, whether they're Rinpoches, you know, high lamas, or you know authorized teachers like me coming to Tara Mandala, that we all need to agree on some basic, uh, being conscientious about some basic uh, agreements. And so I want to share these five classic precepts for lay practitioners. They're called Panchashila. In Sanskrit, pancha means five. Shila, as you probably already know, S-H-I-L-A means ethics or virtue very important aspect of the trainings in in dharma and they are simply not killing not stealing not lying and not engaging in sexual misconduct and not becoming intoxicated so i want to take a few minutes to break these down a little bit because we can also think of them in the positive so the first precept is to undertake the precept to abstain from taking life to care for and protect all living beings, our mothers. So that's really the positive framing of it. To care for and protect all living beings, our mothers. So why does it say our mothers? Because in uh, Buddhist uh, cosmology or thinking, um, because we've all been around this circle of birth and death uh, countless times, we that means at some point or another we've all been each other's mothers, and all beings have been our mother. So that's why we feel compassion for all beings, as if as we do for our mothers, hopefully. <laughs> you know? And um, and really acknowledging the interconnection of all things. And therefore, when we harm another, we're harming ourselves as well. Then the second is to abstain from taking what is not given. In a positive uh, phrase, you'd say to respect the property and boundaries of others. Have you ever found something somewhere and been like, well, is this anybody's? Um, Maybe I can just take it. And then we don't feel good, right? Because it wasn't given. Somebody might have come back for that (laughs) and not found it. So it it even is like that, you know, like respect the property and boundaries of others and don't take what hasn't been given. Now, of course, we're all adults and we can also uh, judge for ourselves, but that was just sort of a subtle nuance example that happened to me recently, I have to admit. And uh, I wound up taking something that I didn't think was being used. I took it back to my place and then the next day I returned it because I felt so bad about it. I was like, that wasn't given to me. Who knows, maybe somebody did want that little shaker. (laughs) So, you know, abstaining from taking what is not given. And if we've done stuff like that, you can confess to your friend, your spiritual teacher. Um, I just confess to you. Okay, so then the third is to abstain from false speech. Tell the truth with compassion. Sometimes the truth might be a little like bitter medicine. So always stay connected to your bodhicitta, your compassion. Speak truth. Uh, Try to abstain from telling lies. Now that's a nuanced thing. We could also spend all night on that one. And that also includes like refraining from uh, gossip, lying, divisive, and discursive speech in your community. 
Now, I have to say, and I think even I have mentioned this before, actually gossip, not gossip like when you're talking bad about someone, but when you're making small talk can be a bonding experience. So we're not saying don't engage in small talk, but the kind of undercutting gossip is is a, another way of refraining. If we refrain from that, we refrain from false speech or lying. The fourth is to abstain from sexual misconduct and refrain from breaking the sexual boundaries of those in committed relationships. So positive light would be respecting your own commitments, respecting the boundaries and commitments of others, and also avoiding harming through sexual misconduct, abuse, and so on. Um, Avoid exploitation or relationships of a sexual manner that are outside of the bounds of the relationship commitments that we've made to another or that involve a person who has made vows to another, right? So being honest, being honest, being forthright. And at Taramandala, we've had uh, issues of people, staff, but also teachers being sexually inappropriate. And we've had to put our foot down. We make even the lamas sign this when they come to teach. So it, we were really one of the first Tibetan Buddhist centers in the country, we, we think, that we know of, who instigated this back, you know, in the 90s. Um, and then the last one is to um, abstain from intoxicants, which tend to cloud the mind, cause harm, and lead to breaking other precepts. So it doesn't mean don't have a beer every once in a while or a joint even if you want to. I'm not against any of that and I'm not preaching that. I'm just saying what they say here is don't get so intoxicated to the point where you lose your judgment. That I think is a very helpful thing to think about. I'm not asking you to take any of these vows tonight. I just wanted to share these very classic Buddhist lay practitioner precepts that are very common all across traditions within Buddhism. And it's kind of like if you say you're a Buddhist, it means you've taken these vows and you've taken refuge in the three jewels. That's like, what is a Buddhist? That's what Buddhists are. It doesn't mean you have to take all of these all at once. Maybe you're thinking about a few of them. Uh, Maybe, you know, you can aspire to not kill, but you also know I might step on an ant every once in a while. That's okay. Everybody does that. So um, this not getting... And not taking intoxicants to the point of losing your good sense of judgment. Because we do harm when we lose our sense of judgment. We can do harm. And so it's important conscientiously to hold some form of integrity along these lines. That's an important part of being a Buddhist. Um, And so that is that third point of conscientiously maintaining your precepts, whatever those are. Like maybe you've just taken the first precept and that's all you're willing to do. So hold that conscientiously and and with mindfulness and uh, try to abstain from non-virtue, from harming others. And so I want to loop back around to faith and read you a little story and then we'll go out with maybe a seven or six minute meditation um eve is that cool did you have anything you wanted to say about that sorry i forgot no no just to see if maybe folks have any questions after you read the story uh, yeah. If we have yeah we could do that absolutely yeah okay this is about faith so such a classic story. I mean, it's so so commonly told in Tibet in Tibet and Tibetan Buddhism. People will refer it to the the, uh, the 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 grandma and the dog's tooth story. So I want you to know this story. It's such a great story. Okay. It goes so. Once there was an old woman whose son was a trader. He often went to India on business. The old woman said to him one day, Bodh Gaya in India is the place where the Buddha went to attain perfect enlightenment. Bring me some special relic from there so that I can do my prostrations to it. She repeated her request many times, but her son kept forgetting and never brought her what she asked for. One day, as he was preparing to leave again for India from Tibet, 
His mother said to him, This time, if you fail to bring me something for my prostrations, I shall kill myself in front of you. (laughs) The son traveled to India, concluded the business as he had planned, and set off back home once more, forgetting his mother's request. It was only as he was nearing his house again that he remembered her words. Now what am I going to do, he thought to himself. I haven't brought anything for my old mother's prostrations. If I arrive home empty-handed, she'll kill herself. Looking around him, he saw a dog's skull lying on the ground nearby. He pulled out one of the teeth and wrapped it in silk. Arriving home, he gave it to his mother, saying, Here is one of Buddha's canine teeth. You can use it as a support for your prayers. The old woman believed him. She had great faith in the tooth, just as if it were really the Buddha's tooth. She did prostrations and offerings all the time, and from that dog's tooth came many miraculous pearls. They're called um, ring cell, these kind of round objects like minute pearls which emerge from the relics of realized practitioners. Sometimes when they do cremation, they'll find ring cell uh, coming out of the bones of of the great master who's been cremated. In any case, so ring cell came out of the dog's tooth, When the old woman died, there was a canopy of rainbow light around her and other signs of accomplishment. Now, a dog's tooth does not contain any blessings, but the old woman's faith was so strong that she was sure that it really was the Buddha's tooth. Through her faith, the tooth was imbued with the Buddha's blessings, until, in the end, that dog's tooth was in no way different from a real Buddha's tooth. (laughs) It's a great story, isn't it? That story really comes back to me again and again. I think about my life, my practice. Why is my practice so stale? (laughs) Where are the blessings, you know? Oh, how, where's my faith, you know? And then find that way. You know, we can't just snap our fingers and have faith, you know? We have to develop those different types of faiths and gain confidence through our own trial and error, our own wrestling with these teachings. Real faith. So any questions or comments? And Eve, feel free to pipe on in here, please. Oh, thank you for posting all of those. They're beautiful, aren't they? I think, did those uh, have meaning for you all? Was it nice to hear those? I find it refreshing sometimes to think about those. I have a little bit of a doubt or a question because when I think about this woman having faith and believing in the dog's tooth and believing that it's the Buddha's canine or whatever, I'm wondering whether there is a danger in falling into some kind of ritualistic I don't know exactly what I'm trying to say, but um, I just feel like for me personally, I think that my faith grows as I put things into practice, the Dharma or the meditation or whatever, and I see the results and that's, that strengthens my faith. And I don't necessarily put my faith in a, thing or an object it almost makes me think as catholics where you know <laughs> thinking about the the little stamp of the of the virgin or the saint or or the cross or or, or, or you know you know what i'm saying mm-hmm. I, I, do. I have a hard time with that so i just feel like and that's why i love buddhism in the sense of my understanding is like well try it it's empirical if it works for you fine if it doesn't you don't have to believe me but that's how my faith grows by seeing really in very practical everyday relevant ways how my practice pays off does that make sense yes yes absolutely i think a lot of us feel that way i i'm also you know have that and feel like that too it's very important and that's not 
separate from or different than Buddhism or this, these teachings here. You have to chew on it. Like the Buddha said, test my teachings. Don't just believe them blindly. And so, and that is what really brings that confident faith. Absolutely. Test it out. And at the same time, you know, what I like about what this story shows us is, is actually it's not in the object out there. She could be praying to anything, right? And so what it, what it, what that illustrates is that what are we bringing to our practice? What kind of commitment and, um, and faith and confidence are we bringing to it? And that is what determines the outcome in a sense. So the Buddha wouldn't say, pray to my image and you will become a Buddha. He actually didn't want to be represented at all. Uh, in fact, he didn't want to have tankas and paintings and statues made up for about him after his likeness because he saw the danger in that. But people by human nature tend to want to do that. They do that anyway. And so in any case, because um, what, what that can do is displace the power. And so that story is not meant to say, let's put power in the teeth, you know, or in the fake plastic object. It's actually to point the finger back at us and say, where's your heart? You know, what are you bringing to the party? Don't wait for Buddha to come out of the sky, out of the clouds and bless you, but like open your heart, crack it open so deeply so that something, something else can happen that transcends the intellect too. The intellect's important, but it can only get you to a certain place, right? Your intellect, Claudia, is very important and, you, and, and it needs to have a large role in your life, in your practice, like, it, like mine does, like everybody's does. But there's a certain point where the intellect can only take us so far and we have to we have to surrender. One of my one-liners that came out of my retreat, I'll just be very transparent, is the abyss is bliss. <laughs> I don't know, maybe somebody else made that up. It just came to me at the end. And that sometimes, I'm not saying the intellect is bad, but I'm just saying the thinking mind, the rational mind, can keep us from cracking open into something that's larger than us. So in a sense, that woman, uh, this grandma, you know, it's also a cultural story. Tibetans are very faith-based, but, you know, Americans are very, I was just reading that, you know, like we are Christian, Catholic, but also Christian, other forms of Christian, very faith. It's all about faith, devotion. It's not really very rational, you know? Whereas Buddhists were pretty rational. We can explain our way to the top, right? <laughs> like, I don't know, you look at the Bible. It's not very logical. Um, so the intellect's very important and valued. And at the same time, there's a p point where the heart's got to have some space too. And often the intellect will help us get to that place. And then you've got the beautiful dance of both being fully embodied and enlivened. We all have different dispositions. You might never have that type of faith, or maybe someday you will. Something will happen and you will. You don't need her kind of faith, though, that kind of faith. You don't need that, perhaps, to walk your path. But what are you bringing, you know? That's, that's what I like about this story. I could pray to a plastic doll, but if I've got faith, it's about what's happening in me. It's just like the Tonglen, right? We don't know if our tonglen is going to help the person out there, but what is it doing to me while I'm doing it? How is it working on me? It's, it's a liminal place. You bring up a very important, you know, let's keep chewing on that. We'll talk about it more next week. Yeah, I appreciate your question. The abyss is bliss. You know, <laughs> the mind, the mind does everything it can to keep us from that abyss because we think it's gonna die. We're gonna die, but we don't die. We 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 
we we are reunited with the great mother that's the bliss of the abyss right but it will what is it our teacher Jennifer Wellwood says you know things don't turn out well for the ego you know on the spiritual path <laughs> I can't remember exactly what she says maybe you can say it either. you know the ego things don't end well but it needs to reckon with that and actually the death of the the little sense of self a small ego is an extremely blissful thing but we fight almost our whole life to keep from having to experience that that's why death is the grand finale you know we have no choice then it really happens Nice to see you all. We've magically made our way to nine o'clock. Um, yeah, Chandra, I just love hearing your heart and mind, especially coming from the retreat. Um, thank you for sharing it with us. And uh, yeah, thank you all for joining us. And we're happy to be back. And maybe we'll take a moment to dedicate our practice. And just consider if there's been any benefit from considering and reflecting on these essential teachings. Maybe we feel motivated or inspired. May that radiate out and be of benefit to as many beings as possible so that they too could feel that inspiration, belonging, safety, and ease. May all beings be free. May all beings know ease and peace. 